if you're playing in the Big Ten and you're playing at these storied institutions and you've got those numbers behind the teams, it's going to be special. Test one, two. Test one, two. One, two, one, two. Dick Vitale was there, so when you see him at your game, you know it's, it's a big game. Their fans were cheering, yelling at us, and it's like, it's been hour and a half before tip-off. Like, what are you guys doing? That was the day that Michigan was on the map. People wanted to see Michigan. They wanted to see the proof. February 2nd, 2013. That night, the Michigan Wolverines found themselves in uncharted territory, boasting a 20-1 record, the best ever in program history. The maize and blue took the court for a primetime showdown at number three ranked Indiana as the nation's number one team. That was the loudest atmosphere I've ever played in my entire life. And we are ready for a big one here in Bloomington. Just to be a part of that, you know, is very, very special, and especially not being number one for at least 20-something years. It's just legendary around here. You see the banners, the Big Ten banners, the National Championship banner. They've gotten to the Sweet 16 for the second consecutive year. And they're a team that every year in the Sweet 16 comes around. Michigan's probably going to be there. You didn't think twice about it. Turkley, it. The game is over. A stunning victory. You talk about the back-to-back -back championships that were won in the 80s. You know, and then you fast forward to the Fab Five era and that phenomenon that they created. After they left, it was kind of like Michigan basketball kind of went down for over two decades. The University of Michigan has punished its own men's basketball team, imposing a postseason ban for 2003 and forfeiting victories from four previous seasons because of a scandal involving a former booster. After decades of national prominence, a scandal involving clandestine loans by a rogue booster resulted in both self-imposed and NCAA sanctions in the early 2000s. They gave so many memories to so many people, but at the end of the day... Michigan went from being a national power to being an afterthought from 1999 to 2008. Zero NCAA tournaments. A 19 0 run and the third timeout of the first half called by Michigan. I had a young man that I was recruiting that was born in 1990 ask me if Michigan was ever good in basketball. And that was shocking to me. The program as a whole was more searching for an identity. And I think that's one of the things that Coach Bielan actually brought in. He brought in a culture. Nice job. Here we go. Put him up. Go. His first year, um, we went 10 and 22 that year. A tough year. I mean, a very tough season. Another Michigan turnover as John Beeline is furious. 2009-10, they have a really bad season. They were 15-17, and then the start of 2010-11, they're terrible. I think at that point in time, maybe you start to wonder, uh, is this actually going to happen? You know that if you don't turn it around, you could be in the same category as the last coach. You could be looking for a job. And as a result, um, that was survival. On January 27, 2011, Michigan sported a 1-6 mark in Big Ten play and traveled to the Breslin Center in East Lansing, where the Wolverines hadn't won since 1997. Darius Morris made a couple of threes, and then he made a great pass to Stu Douglas over in a spot we call Glenn Rice. Douglas for three! Yeah! Stu Douglas got it! If you write up a book on what changed Michigan basketball, it might be Stu Douglas' shot from that right corner three-point line. Appling lifts it go. And Michigan, for the first time in nearly 1,200 days, beats Michigan State. You could just see the smile on Coach Beeline's face in the locker room after that game. I'll never forget that. The rest is history. Our record since that game has been phenomenal. I think the rap on John Beeline before he got to Michigan was he didn't recruit the top talent. 
Was that going to be good enough to win the Big Ten? And that was always the rep on him. Could he bring in the right players? And the man that runs the show at point guard, number three, Trey Burns. Coach Beeline would come to the games, and he would see Trey handling uh, the team. He didn't send his assistants to the game. Coach Beeline came to the games. He could see the things that most people didn't see. Jared Sollinger had always been the focus at Northland, and he was this guy who just everyone wanted, and he committed to the hometown team. Well, Ohio State didn't have a scholarship for Trey. He was literally in Jared's shadow. When I was young, I was a diehard Ohio State football fan. With White leading the way, breaking free again! Touchdown, Ohio State! The number one versus number two Ohio State versus Michigan game, I was just jumping up and down the whole game, wanting Ohio State to win. His thought is, okay, I'm going to play in the Big Ten, I'm going to come back with someone else in Columbus, and I'm going to show them what they missed. I was able to play an open gym with Michigan, that summer before Trey uh, took the reins, and uh, Trey was by far the best player on the floor, and you could tell really early that this is a guy that has a presence. Morgan again on another feed from Burke, and they're on their feet in Ann Arbor. In 2012, behind Trey Burke, the Big Ten co-freshman of the year, Michigan stood at the precipice of winning its first Big Ten title in 26 years, needing help from, of all people, the Ohio State Buckeyes on the regular season's final day. We're rooting for Ohio State against Michigan State as William Buford hit a shot against Michigan State for us to win it. What I do? It meant a lot emotionally to everyone because we began talking more to that team ever about being champions. That was supposed to be the team that sort of snapped that Sweet 16 skid. In Nashville, the four-seeded Wolverines met Ohio University to open the NCAA tournament. Hardaway misses again on the inside. We had done a lot that year, but we weren't that talented to play poorly and win. And we didn't play well. I hadn't played my best game. I kept telling myself we can't lose in the first game. March mayhem for the Ohio Bobcats. They upset Michigan. It's a tough loss for our guys, but it's a it's a difficult way to end a season. The worst loss we had all year. Uh, it's just unfortunate that our seniors had to go out like this. I'm still in shock that we lost. It happened to be Final Four weekend, where I received a text message, you know, from Trey Burke, alluding to the fact that he may leave. Trey was literally attempting to do something that had not quite been done. You know, to entertain the NBA draft after the first year at, you know, six feet one. You're 19 years old. Would you rather declare the NBA and maybe make a million dollars or go back to study hall and write a 10-page paper? Those are some of the things that are real. We were able to meet and have some conversation, you know, which led to a trip to Subway, you know, and we had another conversation. I think it's been reported that, you know, he was gone for a minute there and then finally decided that it probably be best for him to come back to school. I decided to stay for my sophomore year here at the University of Michigan. I felt like it was the best decision for me to compete for a national championship next year. If we would have gotten to Sweet 16 my freshman year, I believe I would have been more motivated to go to the NBA. I'm glad I didn't. You know, it was too fast of a jump for me. My freshman year and going into that offseason, I, I worked pretty hard. We asked, why are you coming back? And he said, because I think this team's good enough to win a title, a national title. And we all sort of snickered and kind of smiled and laughed, and he was, you know, I'm not joking. Trey Burke for the 2012-13 season was a class of five true freshmen. Nick Stauskas from Canada, Karis LeVert from Ohio, and three Indiana natives, Spike Albrecht, Glenn Robinson III, and Mitch McGarry. 
Mitch McGarry was the only one that was highly acclaimed. It was the good old grinding class that we normally get. We just really hit the jackpot in judging their capability to develop. Spike Albrecht went to a prep school, had no scholarship offers. I have never watched so much video of a young man in my life. I told our AD, you're either going to fire me for this or it'll make us look pretty good. But I'm going to give this kid a scholarship. For myself, I think I proved a lot of people wrong and I got a lot better at uh, all sorts of my game. Nick Stelskis was so desperate for attention that he and his dad are in the backyard at their house in Ontario putting together these YouTube videos just to show college coaches that this kid can play. As soon as I was born, you know, I had to be stuck in an incubator for two more months. My dad uh, put a Purdue a little baby basketball in my hand. Taking a visit at Purdue was a little different. So going around and seeing his jersey was kind of crazy to me, um, you know, but at the same time, they told me that they were out of scholarships. Glenn Robinson, when he committed to Michigan, he had a famous name, and that was about it. We had all sorts of nicknames going out there. Next 5-5, five, five, Fresh 5. We were playing 5-on-5 five five scrimmage. Coach, I think maybe intentionally, he put all the freshmen together. Glenn came out, I think, made the first shot, had a little conversation for the old guys. <laughs> so now it was on. We didn't just beat him. We beat him, like, five or six straight times. We did put a whooping on him, and I think they underestimated us a little bit. Coach Beeline, he had all of us five freshmen go outside the room, and I think he kind of just ripped into the upperclassmen, like, hey, you guys, you got worked over by a couple of freshmen. <laughs> I always wanted to be better than my dad, and I still do. My AAU coach, I remember him always telling me, one day your dad's going to ask for your autograph. You know, and that's been my mission ever since. Three players on the Michigan squad boasted fathers who played in the NBA. Robinson III, John Horford, and Tim Hardaway Jr. Ever since I was a kid, I used to go to the Golden State Warriors. My dad was playing for them. And then Miami Heat versus Knicks, those battles. So, you know, it's been around me basically my whole entire life. Glenn Robinson, we could relate to one another because guys that were on his back saying that he wasn't going to be as good as his father. You know, and trying to prove them wrong, just like myself. Hardaway finds some space. Michigan cruised to three straight wins to open the 2012-2013 season before traveling to New York City for the preseason NIT semifinals. Just looking at Madison Square Garden Arena, you know, MJ had his big moments there, my father with the Knicks and the Heat. And I just wanted to go out there and just say, hey, my dad played on this court and I can play here as well. Great crossover by Hardaway who knocks it down. Those two games were two fun games for us because we started to see our potential. When we all clicked and decided to play together, it was scary. Look at the play by McGarry. Here's Stelskis for three. They were just saying, we're going to score 80, 85 points. Let's see if you can keep up. At the end of every practice, we would end it with one, two, three, Big Ten champs. And that's how we finished practice. With this group, it was interesting. They would do their own deal. As Big Ten play began, Michigan was a perfect 13-0 and one of the five Big Ten teams ranked in the top 11 in the country. The, the Iowa game and the Northwestern game was both like 90 to 60. And I know the freshmen were like, I don't know if we're going to lose this year. It's hard to go undefeated, but wow, we might have a chance. At 16-0, the Wolverines carried the title of last remaining unbeaten as they prepared for their first major road test in Columbus against number 15, Ohio State. Our video coordinator walks off the bus, and by an inch, an egg just misses his head. And you see this egg all over the floor, and we're like, all right, it's, it's time to play. I got a ticket here, but everybody in the ticket office thought this was Ohio versus Michigan. Actually, what my ticket say is this is the Nutcracker. Here we go. It felt different for me because I was at home. I had probably over 25 people in the stands. Man, we came out 
as bad as I've ever seen us play in the first half. Bang! Zoom! Ohio State by a Bakery's dozen. As a freshman, you always have that one moment where it, it gets to you. I was a confident and cocky kid before, but it's different when you get in front of 20,000 people for the first time that all hate you. When I played against Aaron Kraft, you know, we grew up kind of playing against each other. In the game's final seconds, the Buckeyes clung to a 52-50 lead. I remember seeing Trey with the basketball, and I went to go set a screen for him, and he told me, no, get out the way. He had Aaron Kraft one-on-one -on -one at the top of the key. He launches. I guess the Rams in Columbus, man, they didn't give Trey his uh, hometown love. Trey just started smiling. I'm like, Trey, we lost, but I could tell that smile was because he knew they had dodged a bullet. They put the first loss on us, and now we find ourselves in a little bit of how are we going to respond to some adversity. Michigan had little time to lick its wounds, traveling to Minneapolis only four days later for another road game against a top 10 team. That game was very physical. I remember two of our jerseys got ripped, and one of them was mine. Hardaway again, stepping up large here at the barn. We're up by a lot against Minnesota, and as I intercepted the pass, all I seen was open court, and I kind of thought this was the perfect time to kind of do something. Robinson the steal, wow. and a 360. And this was the first time that really someone had made that type of play, I guess, since the Fat Five era. We were in our class. It was all the freshmen, and everyone started to get text messages and, and Twitter updates. So I remember looking at each other like, are we really number one right now? Word got out in the class, and the next thing we know, our teacher's talking about it, and then that was the discussion for like the next half an hour. On January 28th, Michigan earned the number one ranking in the AP College Basketball Poll for the first time since November of 1992. in Michigan, number one, was great, but it was at a wrong time. <laughs> I don't think we took it the right way. Playing against Indiana was the loudest game I've ever played in in my career. Look at the move by Ola Depot. That's a big time. And I just remember not many things going our way in the first half. Are you serious? Are you serious? That game was Trey Burke playing out of his mind and a bunch of guys who were still sort of learning and they couldn't keep up. Dowskis misses the three. He had a wide open three, but he hesitated. It was almost like they just wanted to kind of shut the freshman down and get us out the game. I don't think I ever went through a game where I scored two points and since I was little. As the time expired, I remember Oladipo going up and doing like a windmill dunk. And it was almost like he was kind of like taunting us a little bit. Tim Hardaway, he was furious. This is a young team, and these environments are tremendous opportunities for them to grow, and that's our only message right now. We did win some games, but it took a while for that adversity, I think, to get corrected. It's a football school, Michigan basketball had taken over. And it's a progression that slowly happened when we won the Big Ten, but now we were fun to watch. McGarry to Robinson. It's like we were superstars around campus. Pretty much every day people would ask for pictures, autographs, things like that. I think I was by myself at, at night, and I'm walking across the street, and these guys jump out of the car. So I'm thinking they got, like, some mace or something. And, and I look back, and it's all this group of 20 guys waiting for autographs. Tim loves you know, the hoopla of the fans. He dies for that stuff. And I was like, oh, Tim might have a big game tonight. Hands to Hardaway. Eyes the three. Get the three! Ohio State visited Ann Arbor for the rematch in early February, the first time in the rivalry that both teams sported top 10 rankings. Burke for three. Bring it up, baby! Oh, give me that, baby! Give it to me! That's the loudest I ever heard 
Chrysler Arena since I've been a part of Michigan. We couldn't really get very good shots. That's why we need pros, because Tim Hardaway can jump higher than those guys, and Tim just took over. Another three on the way. Got it again! Keep feeding the scoring beast. That one three went in, and then Coach Beeline just stepped calling my number, calling my number time, ran off like five. Takes it all the way inside, blocked by Hardaway! That's gonna do it! This year wins! Following the exhausting overtime win over the Buckeyes, Michigan entered a scheduling gauntlet, beginning with a road game at Wisconsin. I remember in watching in the hotel, Wisconsin beating somebody by a buzzer beater. We're thinking we're going to blow them out going into the game. And we step on the court, and it's a challenge for us. Tries to beat the time. In the game's final seconds, Michigan and Wisconsin were knotted at 57. My momentum was going left, so I had to shoot it right a little bit. I didn't know how to react. We focused all of our 30 seconds in that timeout on we had a foul to give. We never talked about staying in front of your man and making sure they have to score over you. I guess I have a chance to foul him, but he takes a dribble, and then I'm like, I'll just contest the shot. I looked, and I'm like, oh, that's off. And I'm like, oh, no, nah, that, that's going in. Launches. And everybody from their bench kind of ran me over. John Beeline's telling Karis LeVert, I told you to foul. It was really like, what was I even in the game for? Like, I was in the game to stop him, and he scored. As a fan or spectator, you're thinking, okay, well, it scores back to 0-0. But in reality, I mean, the momentum had swung so much. For three, in and out. Wisconsin wins it all the time. Michigan limped into State College losers of three straight road games, but there figured to be little danger of a fourth. Penn State had lost its last 18 Big Ten games, including all 14 that season. On the drive, Robinson to third with a hmm. What a start. I had the first six points or something like that. We're thinking, oh, we got this game. Big again for Jermaine Marshall and Penn State within seven. I just kind of kept slipping away, slipping away, and just having her so fast, it's blink of an eye. Back out for the top. Behind 10 three-pointers, Penn State erased a 15-point second-half deficit to stun the Wolverines. He'll dribble it out, and it's an upset. They rush the floor, and Penn State doesn't have enough fans to fill the floor. You're just like, is this how this is going to end for this team? Penn State! felt completely different. The coach's reaction was different. Everything was different about that loss. We had guys in tears apologizing to our seniors because we felt like we just cost them a chance at a Big Ten title. This is the lowest point of low. My coach George said, what the hell just happened? And I said, coach, I have no idea. Sometimes you're a victim of your own success. You can't keep playing at that level. That's impossible when you have virtually no seniors on the floor. It was the first time that I can really remember thinking, uh, this is when Trey puts his foot down and tells the rest of the guys that enough's enough. He was their star player, but I don't, I don't know if he was their leader. We, as captains, we decided to have a team meeting and kind of let the team know how they're feeling. And a lot of guys got caught out. A lot of us were losing focus, you know, people were going out and not really getting in the gym when this is the time that you should be. It was kind of like, you have this job, you have this job, you have this job. If you're not doing it, then are you really in for the team, the team, the team, what we say every single day? We chose to do the social media band because we had a few teammates that were mildly obsessed with social media, and 
It was getting to the point where it was like more consuming than, than basketball. That's when all the hate mail started to come out, all the hate tweets started to come out. Michigan fans <laughs> saying they hate me, they wish we weren't here, that type of stuff. When you hear so many people saying so many negative things, like in the back of your mind, you think about it a little bit and it, and it does bother you. As the calendar turned to March, Michigan looked to avenge a 23-point drubbing suffered three weeks earlier against their rivals in East Lansing. We always do a pregame film session before we go shoot around. And the only thing that was on the screen was them blowing us out, them dancing afterwards. That underdog mentality, that helped them because they got to get back to what made this program under Beeline. I remember really being focused in on defense because they dominated us inside at Michigan State. The revenge game lived up to the hype as the two rivals were deadlocked at 56 late in the second half. Like I said, he dribbled it on the baseline, a turnover, Michigan. We don't get the shot that we want. Trey is, like, visibly upset, like I've seen him about five times in two years. And Trey looks over at the bench like, give me the ball. As soon as they got the ball back, my mind started telling me, you got to get a steal. There's a steal by Burke. At center court, he'll take it in and jam it down. And he says basically a nonverbal. I'm going to let you coaches know that you don't have to run a play for me to win a game. Over. Michigan's going to win. That was the moment where that team started to, to fight back and say, OK, hey, you know, we were pretty good a month ago, in case you forgot. I remember being up all night watching film of the, the Indiana game at Indiana earlier that season. I was up till about 2 or 3 in the morning watching film. You're just going to have to stay in the fight all day long. Just don't stop. The eyes of college basketball are focused right here for the marquee game of the day. The stakes in the regular season finale were simple. An Indiana win would make the Hoosiers the outright conference champ while a Michigan win would give the Wolverines a second straight share of the Big Ten regular season title. They may have had about two or three extra offensive possessions that was critical. They needed those defensive rebounds, and they got them. It's the four set. Put back up by Oladipo to beat the shot clock. Every time they wanted the ball to go to Zeller at the end of that game, you know, they were able to score. Down one with just 14 seconds remaining, Michigan's Trey Burke had the ball and a potential conference championship in his hands. I'm just like, Trey, let's go. And so, like, I set him a screen. Burke got a drive. A lean with a left hand. No, follow up Morgan. Oh, he off. I remember watching that thing sit on the rim, man. It just kind of sat there like it was going to fall, and then it just, like, fell out. It was kind of like I was just standing there stunned because they all ran out on the court. And we knew they had won the Big Ten Championship. There's a sense of being snake bitten, and we were getting, you know, kind of sick and tired of being sick and tired. I can remember all my teammates, they was like, your time is going to come to when you hit a big shot. I would just be like, whatever. Like, it needs to drop, it needs to fall. Michigan falls in Chicago at the Big Ten Tournament. They lose by nine. I can't pinpoint it, but something wasn't right. You just didn't get the, the feeling that they were going to make a run. There's no doubt about it. They have a lot of things that they need to fix. They almost were wanting the season to get over so they could play in the NCAA Tournament. In mid-January, Michigan had won 20 of their first 21 games and earned the number one ranking in the land. Then proceeded to finish the regular season 6-6, six and six, resulting in a number four seed in the NCAA tournament, prompting more questions than answers. After the Wisconsin game in the Big Ten tournament, I get a text message, and it's from Trey Burke. And it says, Coach B.A., I want you to remember on this day that I told you that we will get to the national championship game. 
An easy win against South Dakota State erased the ghosts from the 2012 NCAA tournament first game loss. And two days later, the nation tuned in to see VCU, a 2011 Final Four team, challenge the Wolverines. This was one of the first times where they were the underdog. A lot of people started saying, well, VCU, they're going to upset Michigan. They're going to be relentless. That's one of the biggest things that concern me right now is they are so quick to the ball all over the place. Everybody had us losing that game because they knew the type of style that they played. McGarry. Wow, are they ready? Nobody played the big fella. Early on, Mitch wasn't playing the game the way it needed to be played. A couple of the seniors came to me and said, Coach, Mitch is a great talent, but we got to make sure that he's watching his diet after hours. He's uh, picking up a, an extra meal late at night. <laughs> Connected to our dorm room was Wendy's. And Mitch would get two Baconators. Mitch would eat the Baconator before we got back to the room and eat the second one before we sat down. <laughs> My weight fluctuates so much. If I eat something and I'm not working out as much, that I'll gain five, 10 pounds just like that. But Gary misses everything. Coach Beeline was like, you really need to watch what you're eating. We're gonna have a food journal every morning, every afternoon. You know, They would log what I eat, what I have for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, everything. We match up with Penn State in the first round of the Big Ten tournament. And we go down like 10 to 2. And Mitch single-handedly makes it like 16-16 in no time. I mean, he scores like 10 straight points. And all of a sudden, we see, wow. Look at this outlet. Has he ignited this team? Mitch used the NCAA as an opportunity to reintroduce himself to the country. Oh, look at the straight oh, line right there. They want to press, let's go. We got five guards, we can go. You got me, Mitch? And he smiles, he, yeah, coach, we got five guards. Very strong, wow, how about that for the big fella? Going into that tournament, you wondered if they were gonna have enough. What a lot of when they left Auburn Hills, you thought, is there anybody else in this tournament that can beat this team when they're at their best? Kansas is a powerhouse. They have great players every year, five-star recruits. It was a huge game for this program, for this campus. In the cavernous home of the Dallas Cowboys, Michigan readied for battle against number one seed Kansas in the South Regional Semifinal. I had a drink before the game. It was kind of like an energy drink. And I'm like, man, something's wrong with me. I could remember being in line of the national anthem, and I was literally about to throw up in front of everybody. Burke, the leading candidate for the player of the year, didn't score in the first half as Kansas dominated the battles of both strength and will. Young tries to get position, and he does. It was probably the worst defensive effort they have shown all year. I believe Kansas scored 60 points in the paint. Like, that's unheard of, 60 points in the paint. Jeff Withy said I wasn't that tall, and he said that he would dominate me in the post. He was Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year. And I said, well, I don't got anything to lose. Let's go. Mitch was dominant, really inside. He kept them afloat when they looked like they were going to drown so many times. Kansas built a 14-point lead early in the second half. At the final TV timeout, the Jayhawks still held a commanding 11-point advantage. I always thought we were going to win that game. I'd look at the score and I said, we're going to change that score. There's a cuddle which provides an opportunity for our players to talk amongst themselves. And I recall quite vividly someone yelling out, everybody be quiet, I have something to say. I really didn't talk much. And I silenced everybody. Everybody had their own opinion. I told everybody to shut up. And I told them, we're going to win this game. Doing something that my dad hadn't done, you know, and getting to a Final Four. I've waited my whole life to kind of be one above him or one up him just because of who he was and, and the type of competitor I am. Recovered by McGarry and he backs it home. Coach Beeline was always saying, you can score a basket or get a stop every 10 seconds. All of a sudden, we were scoring virtually on every possession, and they were scoring in every other possession. You saw this look in Trey Burke's eye, like, we are not losing. 
That's worked a long three. Go back with us. Then said, Trey, is there anything you want to run right now? He said, Coach, it doesn't matter. I've got this. Trey was able to get a 10-second call. And you got a lot of room as an offensive player. And to get a 10-second call, that's really impressive. I had to fly back the next day if they lost, so I started shopping for flights. And I found one, and by the time I looked back up, all of a sudden they start chipping it away, and I thought maybe we'll maybe we'll wait to book that. Robinson, a great reverse layup to make it 74-71. With a minute left, you start realizing maybe we have a chance of doing this. Michigan stormed back to slice the deficit to three with 13 seconds remaining, and the Jayhawks on the free throw line. Johnson's free throw, no good. Rebound, Michigan. I looked at coach, you know, asked him what he wanted, and he said, just get the ball and go. And Trey's coming up the court, and I'm saying, you know, Trey's got to be special here. He's got, he's got to be special. Mitch set that screen, which is probably one of the best screens I ever had in my life. I remember he pulled up, and I thought, I was like, wow, that's a bad shot. It was equivalent to the little movie I saw back when I was a youngster, The Day the Earth Stood Still. and the chills that went through your body was something that I had not experienced before in my life. Are you kidding me? I actually kind of had some tears in my eyes after that because you're going to be remembered for this moment. There's a picture of me celebrating before the ball even touches the rim. I knew he was due. That shot, which forced overtime, would just serve as a level of hypnosis for our opponent. He is on. He has taken over this game. And we went through the overtime period with no doubt that we were coming out with a win. The Wolverines of Michigan come from 14 down to defeat the Jayhawks of Kansas. There was three minutes and 50 seconds left and we down 11. We can't stand. We're not done. I think it will go down as one of the most memorable comebacks in the history of college sports. Less than 48 hours after a comeback for the ages, Michigan faced Florida for a berth in the Final Four. One win, one day. Let's get this one. Let's sing that. Let's cut down some nets today. Yeah, <laughs> While the national anthem was sung, I look at my teammates and everyone's looking straight. And Florida looks scared. The first half of the year, Nick Stauskas was a monster, shooting 50% from three-point range. And he said, I'm the best shooter in the country. Every game throughout the tournament, I was like 8, 9, 10, 11 points. And, you know, I wasn't doing much. I think I was talking to my dad, and you know, we're talking like, man, I got to have a big game soon. That's not good. After that day, I felt good, and I came up to him before the game, and I was like, don't worry, I got you. Like, this is my game. I can feel it. Stauskas lines up another three. He is we had this game against Florida on Easter Sunday. And what a perfect time for Nick Stauskas to be resurrected. Gets it to Stauskas. That's five for five from downtown. I think it was after the fifth one where I hit it and I just ran down the court and I was screaming. Michigan took a 47-30 lead into the halftime locker room, conjuring up a flashback for head coach John Beeline to his 2005 West Virginia team. West Virginia, we got way up ahead of Louisville way too early, like 18 with 30 minutes to go. And they ended up beating us in overtime. And my biggest issue going into halftime is don't let them see any stress in me about what can happen in these games. We were starting to pounce on them a little bit, and I could see, like, the signs that they were kind of getting, like, almost on that verge of quitting. Oh, the steal by Albrecht! What a play! This is easy. This is not the way you're supposed to get to the final four. The Wolverines of Michigan headed to the final four in Atlanta. The Wolverines advanced to the final four in Atlanta with the most lopsided regional final victory since 1999. One, two, three, Everyone is climbing the ladder. This is the first time any of these guys have done this. And when Beeline got up there, it was a scene that he had not felt before. And because this is what defines a coach. 
You know, what makes Coach Beeline so special? It's his ability to, to live in the moment. Yeah, how do we play? Oh, how do we play? Oh, oh, let's miss oh, oh. We're going to be yeah. Yeah. I try to get him to stop for a moment and, and appreciate, you know, where God has taken us, where um, you have taken us, and for the community at large, it was just a proud moment. We had just made it to the Final Four, and this is something that every kid dreams of. And for those fans, that university, to be back on that national stage, I'm getting chills right now talking about it. The bigger the stage, the brighter the lights, the better that you are. So let's get to the biggest stage, the brightest lights on Monday by getting this done today. Let's go. In the final four, Michigan encountered another number four seed, Syracuse, whose head coach Jim Beheim had never lost in nine head-to-head -head meetings with John Beeline. We know they're playing a primary defense, which is 2-3 zone. So the coaches kind of put in a whole new scheme. I mean, we probably put in 30 new actions that we hadn't had all year. What sticks out most was the extra 15-minute period that coach had put into the practice schedule to work with Mitch McGarry to pivot and what the reads were. And I'm saying, wow, he's preparing him for the moment. Turnaround shot, McGarry knocks it down. If he wasn't shooting the ball and scoring it, he was passing it to someone else and getting open looks. Albrecht off the bench with a three, and he too contributes to the Wolverines' call. Spike hadn't missed a three the whole tournament. So Spike came in, hit a couple threes. I hit another three from the corner. LeBert, he's hit two now. And before you know it, me and Spike are leading us in scoring. With under 30 seconds remaining, Michigan nursed a precarious two-point lead. Stretch, gonna drive on LeBert. We made eye contact. It was one of those moments like, are you gonna come down here? And it's an offensive foul on Trish. I was so thankful that he had taken so many charges during the year, and Coach commended him so much on taking those charges. Michigan on its way to the championship game. I'm a Jordan Morgan's charge guy. Oh, yeah. I'm really proud of you, but we're not done. Riding the bus to the championship game on Monday night was as unique a feeling as you had because no matter what you did, it was the last game. Standing between Michigan and a second national championship, another number one seed, the Louisville Cardinals. I want you to envision that, think about what that's going to be like at the end of this whole thing, that we're walking around that court, cutting down nets, getting it done. <laughs> I remember talking with uh, Jimmy King, and he'd said that Juwan Howard, Ray Jackson, himself, and Jalen Rose were going to be there. It was a sidebar, for sure, and one that was pretty vibrant. I had a bad game against Syracuse, and I wanted to come out and be aggressive. Puts up the three, and hello, championship night! Trey had our first seven points of the game. They were impressive seven points. I, like, nudged Bogarts, and I was like... Dude, I was like, I'm not playing this game. I was like, Trey's about to have 50. Here's hands up. He knew he was going to get fouled. Trey Burke. I picked up that second foul, and, you know, that's when Coach had me down, and I didn't play till the second half. Spike is 5'11". You <laughs> probably thought he was the ball boy. No one knew who Spike was. There was times where he would give Trey, you know, problems in practice, and I guess... He finally got that opportunity on the biggest stage. Albrecht in the corner hits the three. Spike hits the first three, and everyone starts looking at each other like, this is crazy. And then he hits the second one from deep, deep. Albrecht, this is unbelievable. 
I was running back and I was yelling, they can't guard me. And like, who am I to say that, you know? So I'm trying to write on this Fab Five stuff, and all of a sudden I look up and I see, you know, Spike Albrecht has 12 points or whatever it is, and I'm just like, wait a minute, that's, that can't be right. Albrecht hit his first five field goal attempts, including four three-pointers. At one point during Albrecht's improbable run, the five Wolverines on the floor were all freshmen, and this second coming of the Fab Five scored 26 straight first-half points for the Wolverines. My favorite play would have to be when I dove on the ground and threw the pass to Mitch for my butt, and then Nick drained a three. Stauskas, can he finish it off? Yes! Now he's got the ball at the top of the key. He gives a little eye fake and goes down and lays it in, and Coach Patino is saying, time out. Who is this guy? Like an out-of-body experience. <laughs> Are you kidding? We get to the huddle, and everyone's just looking at each other, like, what is going on right now? Glenn was screaming. He's like, I told y'all he could play. He's like, I told y'all he could play. And I was laughing. Like, that's literally all I could do. I was just laughing because I couldn't believe what was going on. Behind the shooting exhibition from Albrecht, Michigan enjoyed a 12-point lead as the teams huddled for the final TV timeout of the first half. We were playing so well, and what happened was Luke Hancock. When a guy hits four threes in a row, here's Hancock. It totally changes the game. Oh, my goodness. Luke Hancock actually has a similar story. And these two guys are now, that's the biggest storyline in this game. I think Hancock wants to issue a challenge to Albrecht. What a great half of basketball. There's great storylines out there. So many good things happening in that game. And you're up by one at the end of that. Thank you. We couldn't stop them. Peyton Siva and Russ Smith were two fastest guards I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> at the same time, they couldn't stop us either. In the second half, neither team led by more than five points. And with just over five minutes remaining, Michigan trailed by three. It came down to that wire, man. I still wish I had that block back. Oh, they call it now. And can't believe it. Trey's block on the shot was a big play in the game, I thought. It was called a foul, uh, and it, that was a tough break for us. I got that block, we could have came down and hit a three, and now it's a tie game. I wasn't gonna stop fighting, but we kind of knew that they had it in their hands. We put on one hell of a show, it was a great game, and uh, just sometimes you don't win basketball games. And the cards come up pieces in a game for the Eagles. I didn't believe we had lost. I just wouldn't put it in my mind that we had lost the national championship. I remember, like, the coaches and some of the guys were trying to, like, you know, stay positive and stay upbeat and be like, you know, what you guys did was incredible, but at the time, no one was really wanting to hear that. I just remembered all the old Fab Five guys being in there, you know, just telling us, you know, it's going to be all right, man. Everyone was crying, not because of the result, because this team would never be together again. When I told people I was going to the University of Michigan to play basketball, they kind of looked at me funny. You know, they say, you're better than that. It's crazy to think about, but we really kind of brought Michigan back on, onto the map. That was always, you know, the feeling is, can it ever happen again? People said, well, okay, here's the proof. They did it. Yeah, I don't think it's about that one year. One year is sort of a great example of what a program can do if everybody's united. We won't regret anything. I think I'll consider it a championship team forever, even though we came this close. I remember Spike gaining like 40,000 followers on Twitter and just off of one game. He said, Spike, you should tweet Kate up then. For whatever reason, I decided to. And then literally within a minute, I had over like a thousand retweets on it. And I was just like, oh, God, what did I just do? All we hear on ESPN is, does Spike have a chance? Does Spike have a day with Kate Upton? My phone was just nonstop for, like, the next, like, 48 hours. 